One out of every 20 people in the United States is estimated to have hypothyroidism. And today we are searching for hope. We are searching for answers and foods that can help. Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching in more than 150 countries around the world and making the exam room one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. And today we're talking all about the thyroid. You just heard one out of every 20 people in the US will have hypothyroidism. But what about people who have hyperthyroidism? We're going to get some help for them as well. And how much of these thyroid issues can be driven by diet. Checking in with the answers today is Dr. Neil Barnard and also with his book, The Power Foods Diet, about to hit store shelves. We're going to be doing the Power Foods Focus and this time searching through the secrets of cinnamon. Could that perhaps also offer some help? We're going to find out with the Power Foods Focus in just a little bit. But if there's a question you would like to ask Dr. Barnard, post that in the comments or in the chat, and we will get to as many as we can when we open up the doctor's mailbag on the show today. And with that, let's go ahead and welcome the author of The Power Foods Diet, Dr. Neil Barnard, back to the show. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Chuck. Hyper and hypothyroidism. Let's start with this. What is the difference between the two? Okay, uh, really important. And and not sufficiently appreciated by people. Uh, your thyroid gland, here at the base of your neck, and it's sort of the Clark Kent of your body, which is to say, very unassuming, you don't even know it's there, but it's very, very powerful. Your thyroid gland makes thyroid hormone, which gets into your bloodstream and basically gives you energy. So you get up out of bed, you walk into the bathroom and you look in the mirror and you say, you know, my skin doesn't look healthy. My hair doesn't even look right. I got no energy. I'm gaining a little bit of weight. What, what, you know, uh, what's, what's the problem? And the problem sounds like it's just all over the map. But your doctor says these could all be symptoms of hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism means your thyroid gland is putting out too little thyroid hormone. The opposite, hyperthyroidism, the thyroid gland is putting out too much thyroid hormone, and it's just the opposite. Instead of being sluggish, you are revved up. Your pulse is faster. You feel faster. You feel, and, and you may be losing weight. Although once in a while, some people will uh, paradoxically gain weight with this one too, probably from overeating. Um, but your skin doesn't feel right. Your hair still doesn't feel right because your thyroid is just out of balance. So Chuck, hypo means too low. Hyper means too high. All right, so we're talking about roughly 5% for hypothyroidism, maybe a little over 1%, I believe, is the estimate for hyperthyroidism. So you're talking about 6% of the population that's having some sort of thyroid trouble. That seems like a really high number. What do we believe are some of the big factors when it comes to having a dysfunctional thyroid? Well, you know, I think the numbers may even be a little bit higher because what we're starting to see is that people are kind of on the borderline. Their blood tests are technically normal, but they're still not feeling very well. So I think the numbers may be even a little bit higher. But the factors, the, the number one factor worldwide is a lack of iodine. Um, here in the United States, not so much of an issue, but iodine is an element. If you don't have it, then your body cannot make one molecule of thyroid hormone. You gotta have it. Now in the United States in the mid 1920s, the Morton Salt Company did a clever thing is they put little traces of iodine in salt, iodized salt. And they pretty much eliminated iodine deficiency in the United States and you just didn't, you just didn't see it. Worldwide, it still does happen. Um, there are some areas where you never see an iodine deficiency like Japan because sea vegetables loaded with iodine and uh, in Japan, if anything, they might even be getting a little bit too much uh, iodine. So iodine deficiency uh, is an issue, but here in the United States, the big driver is not iodine deficiency. It still happens. People need to check, uh, particularly if they are a modern person not having iodized salt and they're having Himalayan salt or kosher salt or sea salt or something like that, which is not iodized unless it says so on the label. But for most people here in the United States, the problem is something different. It's antibodies. Your white blood cells 
for some reason are creating antibodies, which are like little protein torpedoes that are aiming at viruses or they're aiming at bacteria. That's what they're supposed to be doing. But for some reason now your white blood cells are making these torpedoes, these antibodies that are attacking your thyroid gland. And now your thyroid gland can't make the normal amount of, of uh, thyroid hormone. So that's called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Very, very common. Doctors can diagnose it pretty easily because you can detect these antibodies right on the blood test. And what are some of the more common symptoms? I'm thinking back to some of the stories that you included in your previous book, Your Body in Balance. And it sounds like, to borrow your term, uh, some of these individuals were going through quite a heroic bout uh, with, with this disease. Yes, um, and, and it's challenging in two ways. One is the symptoms are no fun. You know, you're, you're gaining weight for really no reason. Your energy is low. It can trigger mood problems where your depression you know, it kicks in. It's, it's sort of like you just are out of gas. Um, and, that, and the other problem that people have with this is sometimes they have a, it takes a long time to get diagnosed. Many times because the symptoms are so vague that the person doesn't go see the doctor at all. So we think, well, of course, I'm depressed. I've got work problems or I've got family issues. Um, of course, I don't feel right. I'm just getting older. And we kind of let it slide. Um, but doctors can diagnose this really quite easily with a couple of simple, simple laboratory tests. Very, very simple. All right. And so let's go ahead and open up the doctor's mailbag here and see if we can't get some relief for some uh, individuals here. We'll start with Rosa Lee, uh, who has already taken a hard look at her diet. She says she developed a hyper or I'm sorry, hypothyroidism about four years after already uh, eating a whole food plant based diet. She says uh, she developed that about three years ago now and has gained 15 pounds. Interesting that this may happen while eating a whole food plant based diet. Um, obviously we don't have her exact medical chart here. It's impossible to say exactly what's going on, but is this possible when somebody thinks that they're eating a really healthy diet to still occur? Well, it can. Um, and first of all, uh, it's important to see your doctor and your doctor can diagnose what kind of hypothyroidism do you have? Is it related to, to being low in iodine? And that can happen. Let's say a person goes on a whole food plant-based diet. They're doing great, but they're, they're not having any salt. So they're not getting iodized salt. And for some reason, let's say they didn't acquire a taste for seaweed and they're never having any seaweed. Um, before, they might have been getting iodine from dairy. Now, um, the dairy industry sometimes brags about it, dairy products, milk, having iodine in them. But where the iodine comes from, it's either a supplement they gave to the cow or commonly it's a disinfectant. Um, when the farmers are, or the, the dairy farmer is putting the milking machine on the cow's teats, they first uh, dip them with a, a disinfectant that has iodine in it. And some of that disinfectant then gets into the milk. And there are traces of dis disinfectant in pretty much every, every carton of milk. And so that's got iodine in it. Now, obviously drinking a disinfectant is not gonna be the best source of, of iodine. But let's say that was the source you were getting and now you're not getting that and you're not having seaweed, you're not having iodized salt. Could you run low in iodine? Sure you could. And your doctor can identify it and it's the easiest thing in the world to treat. Um, you would take an iodine supplement, which if you go to the store, you a uh, uh, health food store, they usually market it as a kelp derived, seaweed derived, kelp derived supplement. and. Uh, there you go. And, and your doctor can test this and see uh, the adequacy of it. Very, very simple. If that was not the issue, then even a person who's on a vegan diet could be at risk for antibodies forming. Although I have to say vegans are at the least risk for this of any group. In the Adventist Health Study 2, researchers looked at the prevalence of hypothyroidism in vegans compared to lacto-ovo, you know, people drinking a lot of milk, uh, lacto-ovo vegetarians, or omnivores. And the lacto-ovos actually had a fair amount of hypothyroidism, probably because the milk proteins are triggering the antibodies. And the people who had the least hypothyroidism were, were the people following the vegan diet. So plant-based diet, great way to go. You do need iodine. Your doctor can test you. If you're low, you take an iodine supplement or, or um, pack in the sea vegetables and you'll be fine. 
let's say somebody is a little bit low on iodine and they begin supplementing, how long might it take for that to build up in their system to alleviate the symptoms that they've been experiencing? Um, well, the, the, the amount that's, that gets in your blood can, can be rectified right away, but it takes time for your thyroid gland. Just you keep in mind, your thyroid says, you know, I've had a lot of orders for thyroid hormone for a while. It's going to take me some time to, to, to get these orders out. Um, so it could take time for the symptoms to go away. It could take, you, you will likely feel better within a matter of a couple of weeks, but it could take, can take longer than that. And the th if you've been gaining weight as a result, it will take some time for that weight to melt away too. Um, but do see your doctor and, and your doctor can then track how your thyroid level is over time. And what they're especially looking at is something called TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, and if that's too high, that means your body has been pushing and pushing and pushing to try to get the thyroid going and without success. And so your doctor will track that along with other blood tests to see how you're doing. You mentioned weight there a couple of times. Obviously, weight gain is a symptom of these conditions. But what is obesity by itself perhaps also um, something that could trigger the, the thyroid to start malfunctioning, so to speak? Well, it's, it's more often the other direction. Um, that, that the, the thyroid can contribute to weight problems when it's not functioning. Now, typically, a low thyroid doesn't lead to massive obesity. Um, it's usually a more mild uh, weight increase, but it's there, and you'll notice it, and, and along with it comes other, other things where you feel like your body tissues, your skin, your hair just aren't responding well because they're not getting the hormone that they need. Let's take a question from Louise, who's already been put through the ringer. Uh, sounds like they've had a total thyroidectomy already. And Louise is wondering whether food still influences health in the same way after you've already had that thyroid taken out. Okay, that can happen. I mean, let's say a person has thyroid cancer, which which can occur. Uh, or other, uh, there are other reasons for a thyroidectomy where your thyroid's gone. At that point, your endocrinologist needs to prescribe uh, thyroid hormone, which you are going to take for the rest of your life. And will foods behave the same way? Yeah, they, they sure will. Um, you are now supplementing the thyroid thyroid hormone rather than having your thyroid make it because your thyroid's gone. But uh, you could still be healthy. There's no reason why this should limit your, your health or your longevity. All right. Well, let's talk about a specific food here that might jumpstart the old thyroid here. Um, and we'll do that as we open up the Power Foods Focus and open this up uh, as we get ready for the release of your latest book, The Power Foods Diet, that comes out March 26th. There's a link to pre-order your copy right now in the episode notes. Uh, very excited here about this one in particular because the last time you were on the show, Dr. Barnard, we talked about uh, my love of blueberries on top of oatmeal in the morning, and then I sprinkle a little bit of cinnamon on there too. And you got so excited about the cinnamon. And I'm wondering what the connection is between cinnamon and thyroid health here. Well, the, the, the amazing thing is that we think of cinnamon as just a spice. It tastes really, really good. And you can add it. To, it's very versatile. I mean, you can add it to your morning oatmeal. You can add it to desserts. You can add it to all kinds of things. But it seems to actually have an effect on the metabolism in some way. It seems to rev it up a little bit. Now, researchers have speculated about this for a long time. And I have to say, I like to take all of these things with a grain of salt. I want to be cautious about it because we were all researchers are always eager to find out good news about something that they thought was just tasty and delicious. Um, but there have been so many studies on cinnamon with fairly consistent results that we've come to believe that this is something real. And one of the best of these was a placebo controlled trial in 2017, researchers brought in more than 100 people and they randomly assigned them to take either cinnamon or a placebo. And to keep them from knowing which was which, they put it in little capsules so they, they couldn't taste anything. And they gave them the capsules of either the placebo, the dummy pill, or the cinnamon. And over a 16 week period, they just tracked people. Nobody knew what they were getting. Then everybody gets on the scale. And at the end of 16 weeks, what they found is the people having the cinnamon had lost practically eight pounds um, compared to the control group. So this is big stuff. So the question was, how could this occur? Um, the first thing is they were eating more cinnamon than, than people would eat. They were getting in their capsules about a teaspoon per day, which is easy to do. I mean, you can easily add this to to oatmeal or other cereals or, or things, or even in a, in a hot tea. So it was, it's not difficult to do, but it's more than people tend to take. Secondly, researchers started teasing apart cinnamon 
and they found a novel compound in it. And now, now researchers are not necessarily very creative with naming. They, they, they called it, it's an aldehyde, so they called it cinnamaldehyde. Um, and the cinnamaldehyde, what we believe, actually triggers the release of natural hormones in your bloodstream such that you your metabolism is more like it was when you're 14 and less like it was when you're 65. So it's just a little bit of a metabolism booster. So there you have it. Uh, the, the, my book, The Power Foods Diet, talks about power foods, and I'm going to put some spices into that category as well. Ginger is one, hot peppers are one, but cinnamon is one that's been pretty well researched and really interesting. Very interesting indeed. Uh, again, there's a link to pick up your copy of The Power Foods Diet. You can order the pre-sale right now so it'll be delivered to your door on the day it's released. That link is in the episode notes. Got to ask you a little bit more about cinnamon because you're kind of blowing my mind at the moment here, my friend. I'm wondering, is this specific to you know, just the straight cinnamon spice or... You know, what if somebody were to say, oh, I don't know, eat a lot of cinnamon Pop-Tarts or a lot of cinnamon toast crunch. I mean, is there enough cinnamon in either one of those two foods to kind of offset all of the other stuff that might come packaged with it? Oh, what a wonderful question, uh, Chuck. Um, as you'll see in the Power Foods Diet, we talk about which kind of cinnamon you should buy. Um, and the one to buy is called Ceylon cinnamon, uh, C-E-Y-L-O-N, Ceylon cinnamon, as in Sri Lanka. Um, there that's, or sometimes it's called true cinnamon. There are others that taste very similar, maybe even taste a little, little bit stronger. Um, you'll, you'll see them labeled uh, Chinese cinnamon or a uh, Saigon cinnamon or Indonesian cinnamon. They're fine. You can cook with them, but if you want the effect that we are describing, Ceylon cinnamon is the one you want. Um, and let me give you another tip or two, if you don't mind. Um, number one, get Ceylon cinnamon. The others are fine for cooking, but they're not going to have this effect. Uh, number two, buy organic. Um, and with some foods, it doesn't really matter that much if you buy organic or not. An organic banana, organic orange, you're going to peel off whatever is on the peel anyway. But with cinnamon, um, it does make, make a difference. When you look at the purity of the compound, getting organic is well worth it. And it's not dramatically more expensive. Uh, number three, think pretty liberally about where you can put it. Um, your morning oatmeal, great place to start. You can put it on any kind of cereal. You can put it on waffles, pancakes, cookies, healthy cookies. Uh, the Power Food Diet has lots of healthy desserts. Um, so we have a nice cinnamon right rice pudding, which, you know, that's a nice dessert, very light, very delicious, or an apple cinnamon skillet. Um, and maybe my favorite one, this is one you and I were talking about before, Chuck, um, when a person makes French toast which is frankly just a weight gain recipe if it's made the normal way. We have a French toast recipe. It you know, really is, you know, with the eggs and the milk and you know, drenching and all, you know, soaking up all those calories. We have a, a, a French toast recipe in the Power Foods diet that is totally vegan, very light, really delicious. But when you do it, look on the page for the blueberry cinnamon syrup, which is made with blueberries and some cinnamon and a little bit of maple syrup and a couple of other ingredients, very light but it is just the most amazing breakfast. And why, why do we do this? The reason we're doing this, Chuck, of course, is that people think of weight loss as punishing. Don't eat this, don't eat that. If you're hungry, if you want something tasty, feel guilty about things, da, 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 da. Take all that and throw it away. We're not gonna be doing any of that stuff. What we're focusing on is the foods that work, the foods that are your friends, the foods that if you bring them into your diet, they'll rev up your metabolism, they'll help tame your appetite. These are, that's why we call them power foods and cinnamon is one of them. You know, that sounds yummy. I don't know if that is one of Dustin Harder's recipes or if that one was Lindsay Nixon's, uh, but either way, I'm excited and I'm going to try to twist Dustin's arm to bring me some, just like the blueberry uh, pops that you were talking about on the last episode that he included in the book. I want to get, here's what I want to do. I'm just going to have a private conversation with Dustin, and, and you're welcome to join it. I'm going to say, Dustin, this is what I want. Just bring it to me on March 26th when we have the big event at the National Press Club. I'm so excited about this. You call it the Power Foods Revolution here. That is the day that the book comes out. Washington, D.C., just a stone's throw from the White House. Uh, Dustin's going to be there. Dr. Barnard, you're going to be there. Uh, you've asked me to come as well. So we're going to have a lot of people playing in this sandbox. It's going to be a great night. 
Chuck, you are going to lead us off. And I want to hear about your success, needless to say, because you have it. I got to tell you, Chuck, I've always been so grateful for everything you've done here on the exam room. You educate people, you inspire them. You are never going to know how many lives you've saved, but it's huge, Chuck. And that's the truth. And you're going to be there leading us off on March 26th. Dustin will be there. I'm going to be there. I talked about the science. Dustin really does kind of the food part of it. Uh, Lindsay Nixon also did a many of the recipes. We're having some special guests. And it's a revolution because I don't want weight loss to be a punishment. I want it to be an adventure that gets us to success and brings good health along with it, not just for us, but let's make the next generation healthier too. That's what this is all about. Here, here, my friends. So save the date, mark it on your calendars, March 26th. Ticket information available very, very soon. And if you sign up to become an exam room VIP right now for free, hey, you're going to be among the first to know. So head over to pcrm.org slash exam room VIP right now. Sign up for free. And oh, by the way, in addition to getting uh, access to our special events, we're also going to tell you uh, how you can listen to some of our select interviews two weeks before anybody else. We're going to get you pre-sale opportunities, newsletters, we're going to get you covered. Either way, we're going to get you super healthy. And that is the name of the game. Anyone who's ever had a big radical health transformation will tell you that your life will change in ways that you could never possibly imagine. And we want everyone to experience that, even if you think that all hope is lost. It is never lost. And I guarantee, Dr. Barnard, your book, The Power Foods Diet, is definitely going to be changing some lives as well. Cannot wait for March 26th, my friend. Me too. And I hope that in the same way as I want people to share links to the exam room podcast, because share them with people who need this information. I'm hoping they'll do the same with the Power Foods Diet and uh, maybe with a ticket to come and come to the event. There's nothing like hearing the information in detail, the practicalities, really putting this to work. It'll change your life. Absolutely. So stay tuned. We're going to circle back with ticket information in just a little bit. Uh, but we've got time for a couple of more questions here. Let's just go ahead and do a grab bag a little bit as we wind things down. Michelle is intrigued by our French toast conversation, but is worried about the butter and the eggs and the dairy that might drive up uh, her cholesterol a little bit. She's wondering what can be done to lower my high cholesterol and uh, as well as my high triglycerides. She says that she's exercising a couple of days a week, eating flaxseed along with taking an algae-based omega supplement, yet the cholesterol, the triglycerides are still high. So what advice might you offer for Michelle? Okay, great question. And Michelle might even be wondering if her problem is genetic. And here's the way to know. Um, for the next eight weeks or so, no animal products at all. Now you might be saying, well, I'm already doing that. Okay, that's good. No animal products because that eliminates all the cholesterol and eliminates the animal fat but also minimize oils, no tropical oils at all, no coconut oil, no palm oil, no uh, palm kernel oil, because those are high in saturated fat, cause your body to make cholesterol. So you wanna follow as healthy a diet as possible, have some soy in your diet, have soluble fiber, that's oats and beans. After about eight weeks, get tested. If your cholesterol hasn't budged, then it's a genetic issue. Um, and then you're gonna have a conversation with your doctor about whether statins are good for you, are not good for, for you in your particular case. But if it has come down, then you've nailed it, that, that your cholesterol, like 90% of people's, is strongly affected by the foods you're eating. Triglycerides, this is for extra credit. Triglycerides can be really variable when you switch to a different kind of diet. If you're bringing more sugar in your diet or more white flour and processed flours uh, into your diet, your triglycerides can, drop, can, can rise, but you just take the sugar out of your diet, take the white flour out of your diet, and you're, what you're going to discover is your triglycerides will drop like a stone. Exercise helps them too. All right. And a little bit earlier, we were talking about uh, iodine and salt. Abe has a question about salt, wondering whether there have been any studies showing, uh, showing that black salt is more harmful to your health than traditional table salt. Not that I've seen at all. Um, no, with, with black salt, we haven't seen it to be worse. Um, but keep in mind that the iodized, iodized salt that we were talking about earlier, uh, it's got to say that on the label, regardless of what kind of, of salt it is. If it doesn't say iodized, then there's no iodine in it. 
All right, final question. The honor goes to Stephanie, who wants to know, how can you limit sodium to less than 1,500 milligrams a day on a whole food plant-based diet when you're not a cook and you don't have time? Dr. Barnard, she says that she uh, doesn't get the opportunity to cook from scratch and usually eats uh, plant-strong foods that are lower in sodium, uh, but they are processed as well as salads and fresh fruit. So 1,500 milligrams a day, is that the target that we should be shooting for? And how can somebody get there if they're not spending a lot of time in the kitchen? Okay, well, great question. The first question is whether you need to, uh, to get there. Um, if you don't, if, if you're healthy and you don't have hypertension, 1,500 uh, um, milligrams a day is, is a fairly low target. It's fine, that's great. That's the amount that your body actually uh, benefits from. Um, but to get down to that level for your average person can, can be a bit challenging and you may not need to get that low. It may be that you're fine with two grams or 2.3 grams, something like that. Uh, would be fairly typical. So if your doctor has said, no, this is where I want you to be, how are you going to get there? The salt that's driving up your sodium is not so much the salt shaker at the table that you're adding. That will add a little bit of sodium to the surface of it. The big driver of a high sodium intake is something that was, you guessed it, built into the food before it came on your plate. And you've seen it. Uh, if, if you just pick up a can of soup, and then compare it to a can of no salt added soup. Turn it around, read the sodium uh, content differences. It's day and night difference. One could be 500 uh, milligrams, the other can be much closer to zero. So if you just really don't cook, what that means is you're gonna get whatever sodium was put in at the restaurant that you're eating. Um, I would encourage you, you don't have to become a gourmet, but there are convenient foods that have low sodium content, uh, a very low sodium content, everything in the produce aisle you know, from all the fruit and the fresh vegetables, very, very low in sodium. And some of them like apples and oranges and bananas, you don't cook at all. The others can be cooked very, very easily. You just steam them up. When you buy any kind of canned goods, a soup, canned vegetables, uh, canned fruits, look at the sodium content, pick the ones with no added salt or, or, or low sodium. Very, very easy to do. And it'll pay off for you. Is it possible just out of curiosity to know whether or not in a lot of these pre-prepared, pre-packaged foods, the sodium, the salt that they're using there is in fact iodized or not? Almost always not. Um, the iodized one is the one that is in that little blue box on the shelf with the girl with the umbrella. Um, and there are other other brands too, but the ones that, that the food manufacturers typically use is not iodized usually. There it is. All right, let's go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Let's go ahead and close up the doctor's mailbag for today. If we didn't get to your question, have no fear. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. Uh, but Dr. Barnard, as always, a tip of the hat with a great deal of gratitude to the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund for powering today's episode. Love these guys so much because they do they support organizations like the Physicians Committee that carry on the love that Greg had for animals by promoting plant-based health and working to end animal abuse while emphasizing programs that promote systemic change and all also benefit people. And you can visit them online right now at GregoryWriterFund.org. That's Gregory Writer, spelled R-E-I-T-E-R Fund.org. You see it right there, right there on the bottom of your screen. Highly encourage you to head over to that website and sign up for their newsletter. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know how else to ask this other than the way that we ask every single time that you're on the show. And that is, you know, just how incredible is the work that the Writer Fund does, Dr. Barnard? Well, you know, you said it, Greg had such a heart for animals. He, he really did. He was a warm, such a compassionate person. And Allison has carried that work forward by supporting organizations that are doing exactly that. They're, they're making the world a better place for animals. We're, be, we're delighted to do that. We're getting animals off the plate and working in many other ways. And we're so grateful to Allison and to the team for their support. Here, here, my friend. And here, here to you. Thanks for being here today and helping to raise our health IQs. Much appreciated as always. Thank you, Chuck. It's been great talking to you again today. And to the crew behind the scenes for making the magic happen. Thank you, as always. And to you, Exam Roomies, thanks for tuning in and raising your health IQs right alongside of us. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We will talk to you again very soon. But until then,